Good evening, everyone. I'm Martin Gosden. I'm the uh, South Wales and Western England uh, branch uh, co-chair. So welcome to this uh, webinar this evening. And thank you for spending your time learning a little bit more about um, collaboration and how we go about procuring it. This is our seventh um, branch uh, webinar event uh, today. Uh, tonight we have uh, Ian Heppenstahl, Heptinstal, who's the co-chair of the Contracts and Procurement SIG, and one of our sort of uh, leading experts on procurement and contracts and all that sort of stuff. And he's going to be talking about how you actually foster a collaboration across a sort of a wide range of suppliers for uh, in a particular project, uh, sort of uh, from from a contractual point of view. So Ian's planning some poll questions tonight, and there'll be some stuff on the screen you can see at the moment, which tells you how you can actually join in with the interactive part of uh, of the event. So uh, Ian mentioned this again anyhow, but uh, you've got a little bit of time now just to uh, sort of link up uh, either on a tablet or, or or telephone, or however you want to do that. Uh, using those details on the on the, on the on the screen, so well done for that. Um, the other key thing to, about, about after the event as well, please can you please let us know with the evaluation questionnaire you'll get what you think of, the, of tonight's event, what particularly what you would um, like to see in the future for future events uh, from the branch as well, please. That's very important. That feedback is all about us listening to you and giving you what you want to meet your own personal professional development needs. So please let us have that uh, feedback uh, as much as you're able to. Thank you. A bit of housekeeping, a little bit of APM information. Uh, as I'm sure you know, things are rumbling, rumbling on with COVID still, and um, the, the board, the APM board, has decided there'll be no physical events until at least June this year. And to be honest, I think the way things are going, it may stretch quite a bit beyond that, depending on how um, sort of a confident people are actually going back to real life events again. I know we're all looking forward to that, getting back to buffets and things, but um, uh, meeting everyone in person and networking properly, but uh, we'll have to see how that goes. Anyhow, we're, we're planning a, a forward, forward sort of event program uh, beyond June, and uh, and uh, hopefully we'll be able to sort of get some physical events again in due course. Um, just a reminder, there's lots and lots of excellent APM resources on the website, including the APM Hub, which is a really good a sort of interactive uh, sort of collaboration tool which you can meet your peers and talk and about issues and sort of chat and exchange exchange views so do get involved in that that's going quite well relatively new thing there's also a lot of on uh, learning resources on the APM website as well and APM learning is a fantastic resource for doing a whole load of short term sort of training and CPD uh, type uh, events and uh, sort of uh, interactions you can get involved and understand far more about something you, you do want that you want to develop yourself so do go, go on the website and have a look at that um, there's a lot of information on chpp chartered project professionals well on the website and apm is running quite a few sort of continuous events on uh, sort of webinars on how to apply for chpp well worth looking at if you're looking really seriously interested in actually joining up to that i think uh, there's a, well over 1500 uh, sort of members have actually joined up as uh, CHPP so far, and that's running forward really quickly, which is actually fantastic news. So I mentioned uh, other branch events coming up. On the 6th of April, which is just after Easter, we're going to be looking at indefensive art indefensive artificial intelligence algorithms. Bit of a geeky subject, but it's going to be increasingly important, I think, for us all, both as members of the public as well as our profession in project management, as uh, AI becomes far more prevalent. In actually helping us do some of the more donkey work stuff that we actually sort of need to manage uh, sort of uh, and how we actually run our projects so get involved in that dr nara chamberlain uh, he's a fantastic speaker he's spoken to uh, around data and data analytics and things like that several times over the last few years at our, at our events he's really really good speaker the uh, 21st of april for those of you who are corporate members or know your your uh, organization our, our corporate members we've got our regular branch corporate advisory group event where we get together our local corporates and HEIs to discuss matters of mutual interest so that's again is, is a virtual event so uh, if you're aware of that just please nudge your your seniors or your reps on the, go along to that the 6th of May we're really looking forward to one of our highlights events for this year which is the um, project management challenge finals night so we've got eight teams competing at the moment and they're desperately trying to finish off their final reports, which will be handed in uh, towards the uh, end of this month. Uh, then I'll be spending Easter amongst the other six of the judges, uh, analysing and assessing those reports and uh, coming to a, a conclusion about how we go forward and uh, who the finalists are. And then the finalists will be presenting 
uh, sort of our final reports actually on the night. So it's really good, uh, really good event. Uh, then on the 6th, 18th of May, we're looking at developing a mature risk mindset. And we're really pleased to have Dr. David Hilson of the Risk Doctor fame coming to talk to us. He's a fantastic speaker, really experienced, and he really just crunches the really complex issues around risk down to easy to understand concepts. He's really, really sort of well worth coming along to. So look, look out for that, please. 3rd of June, we're going to look at asset management, compare it to project management. There's quite a lot of similarities. And we're fortunate to have Raul Galazzoni, who's the chair of the Institute of Asset Management, coming to talk to us about that. And 26th of May, so slightly out of order here, so sorry about that. We have Donut Unit, who's going to be talking about how change management can enhance a project's success. So do look out for those next events. And of course, there's lots of other events which are sponsored by other branches and the Pacific Interest Groups on the, um, on the APM events website. So do look out for those. Get booked in and get your CPT points going. Um, so that's coming up, lots coming up. And so I think Ian's back in the room now. He's just died out to get a coffee. So hopefully he's uh, pretty refreshed and ready to go. Uh, so it's now my very great pleasure to introduce our speaker tonight, Ian Heppenstall, who's co-chair of the Contracts and Procurement C. There he is, hello. And uh, he's also the project management lecturer and course leader at Birmingham University. So really pleased to have Ian. So I've got a huge amount of experience in this subject, which he's really personally very, very passionate about. So Ian, thank you very much. Okay, thanks very much, Martin, and uh, great to be here. Right, let me make sure I'm clicking the right buttons. Okay, so oh, that's that's just something about me, uh, as, uh, as as Martin has mentioned. My career in project management, uh, I've not always been an academic. In fact, I've not been a university academic for very long at all. So early on in my career, I managed projects in the chemical industry. Um, initially as an employee of the project owner organization and uh, later on as a, a supplier subcontractor of project management expertise, selling that service to chemical companies and project owners. As the, the co-chair of the Contracts and Procurement SIG, uh, I have also had uh, part of my career working in procurement teams in both the chemical industry and in construction. So I've, I've seen projects from different perspectives. Uh, I will warn you, I'm an unabashed fan of the topic that I'm presenting on tonight, uh, collaborative project contracting. Uh, as was as Martin said, and I think 14 of you have, uh, have, have managed to follow up, it will be great to get some, uh, some of your uh, input and for me to understand what your own background and current understanding of the things I'm going to talk about. That'll help me judge whether to move faster or to pause on certain things during the slides that I've put together. So if you're able to get onto a web browser, either on a phone, a device or another window on your computer, uh, ttpoll.eu is the website. That will take you to uh, an image like the one shown on the screen. You input the session number IH2103A and that will, uh, at the moment, it will say, please wait. I think there's, uh, there's 16 of you on there. Uh, I've managed to get through, that's fantastic, thank you. And then when I move through the next slides, you'll see the questions here on the main presentation. They will also appear on in the browser window. But the key thing is down at the bottom, you will have the choice A, B, C and D. Uh, so that will give uh, me and also you, you'll get an understanding of who else is out there in the audience. So all I know at the moment is just short of uh, 50 people on the call. So if we can start with a few questions, it'd be useful, as I say, very useful to me in, uh, in un understanding the audience. So what kind of project environment and procurement environment do you work in? Bad about that. Leave it for a short while. But, uh, 
So those that are on the town, assuming will be representative of, of everybody else, a roughly even split between public and private sector, uh, some spanning both either in the work they do very often if you work in project supply chains you see uh, you see both. Um, I won't linger on it too long that's great thank you very much. So the second question is to get some insight into the preferred procurement approach in the organisations that you're currently working in uh, ranging from A procurement is actually quite small on your projects and you're here to learn something about slightly different environments uh, through to a strong preference for contracting on fixed price reimbursable contracts where you pay per hour or per day for resources that you use d you tend to use suppliers who you've engaged on long-term frameworks to make the selection much easier uh, e is a, a method known as a project alliance, collaboration, but only for one particular project or something else. If I was a betting man, I would guess that a lot of the long-term frameworks relate to those of you working in the public sector. Uh, quite a few of you, procurement isn't a very big issue. Uh, and that's relevant. What I'm talking about today is much more relevant to the kinds of projects where most of the work on the project is done by outsiders, third parties that you need to contract with uh, who are not employed by the owning organisation. Okay, so if I was a betting man, I would have best bet on something like this, a, a strong preference for fixed price contracts, uh, which in about four or five, five or six slides time, um, I'm going to share some of my thoughts on why I think that's often an inappropriate approach on things like projects. Certainly the more complex and, uh, and uncertain, exciting projects that uh, many of us have the good fortune to be involved with. Okay, well, thank you very much for that. Uh, last one coming up. Okay, one of the options I gave you was Project Alliances or IPD, uh, standing for Integrated Project Delivery. Uh, how aware are you of those ranging from nothing, heard about it, worked on one or two, uh, to having set up and managed them? That would be great. And this looks like a, a good mix as well, because I'd, I'd assumed that most people coming are here were were those who want to find something out about a topic that might sound interesting but they hadn't used much uh, and I think the fact that some 17% of you have actually worked on one uh, will be will, will be good to get some of the the questions and comparisons to see whether the environment you've worked in is similar or different to the the example case study that I'm going to describe in the uh, the back half of this presentation. Okay, so thank you very much for that. That was a bit of scene setting. Uh, the nearest you're getting on a very short one hour or so webinar to introduce yourself to your peers and colleagues who are here. Uh, but thank you very much. That, uh, that certainly helped me to get a feel for who is on the call. Right, I, I want to cover these uh, different areas in, in sort of moving through. Most of the time I want to spend on the last two bullet points talking through the the approach known as project alliancing or IPD. If you uh, if you're uh, used to working in a UK environment uh, you may know the method as project alliancing. IPD, integrated project delivery, tends to be what it's called in uh, North America. And if you're involved in lean construction or lean project management, uh, they tend to prefer the term IPD. The way I define them, these two things are exactly the same. But I'll come on to that a bit later with an example case study. Uh, to start with, though, I just want to le lead in by sharing a few uh, general sort of ideas and principles about collaboration, competition versus collaboration from a procurement perspective, 
from a team management perspective and some of my thoughts on problems and difficulties with common contract pricing methods. So that's the shape I want to run through. Uh, I've got, got a few slides that I'll whiz through. If anyone's got any uh, questions or something isn't clear, please drop a note in the chat um, so that it's captured, you don't have to remember it, or make a, make a real or a mental note of it, and we'll pick that up in the Q&A towards the end. Okay, so firstly, procurement perspectives, the idea of, of, uh, of, of the procurement professionals. Now, there's a, a thinking tool within procurement known as supply positioning or Kraljic analysis, which is demonstrated in this uh, colourful graphic, which is simply meant to indicate a, uh, a two-dimensional graph, uh, often referred to as four boxes, but I, the engineer in me prefers to think graphical, graphically. Along the bottom x-axis, we can think about spend. That's one of the key obvious variables when we think about procurement. How much are we spending? Is it a small amount, medium amount, or a lot of money? The other dimension that this takes account of is inherent risk in the supply market. How easy or difficult is it to work with the suppliers? And that's, that's an amalgam of a number of different uh, considerations that are rolled up into this idea of supply risk. It boils down to how painful will it be if we get our suppliers wrong and they let us down? Is it easy to swap to a difficult, different one or will it be extremely difficult? And depending where the supply markets you're dealing with fit, on this little uh, little map, whether it's A, B, C, or D, will impact the kind of approaches you take to procurement and supplier relationship management. And if you choose the wrong methods in the wrong circumstances, that can lead to waste and increased risk. So this is a basic procurement tool that suggests the horses for courses. Collaboration tends to be more suitable uh, where I put point C on this graph. The types of spend that are spend categories, supply markets, where you spend a lot of money, a long way along the x-axis, but also have got high supply risk. If you get the supplier wrong, the pain that it causes you can be quite significant. And projects when working with main contractors and design contractors and, and significant advisors, will often find that that supply market to them is in area C, high risk, high spend, where general procurement theory suggests collaboration is probably the best way for you to drive value and performance. Uh, another way to look at that, if we look at the money we're spending on a particular, with a particular supplier, with a particular supply base, and here I'm only looking at price, being made up of the costs the supplier incurs and the margin, the profit margin they make on top of that. The methods of competition would tend to focus on the margin. You know, bidding, shopping around, using internet services that trawl everybody who's selling something and can sort them into order of price. There you're squeezing the margins. Collaboration is all about working together to look at cost side of the, the makeup of price and to see what we can do together to make sure that the costs that are being incurred are appropriate and not wasteful. So that's just one example of a very different mindset. Uh, I boil it down into two very simple mental images. If I'm using competition to manage value and performance, my analogy is a door. Suppliers will need to come in and out of that door. Just like we're in, in professional sports, the relegation from the premiership to the championship is what drives competition. If there's any rugby fans, uh, there's talk at the moment as to whether uh, not to have promotion and relegation and the impact that that could have on the quality of the game and the levels of competition. But fundamentally, at a human nature, the ability to enter into 
an area you have not worked with before and the risk of getting kicked out if you don't perform is, is fundamental to the use of market competition. Nothing to do with just get five bids. If you always choose the same suppliers and you've not got some coming in and out of the door, nobody will believe you're really using market competition no matter how many bids you get. On the left for collaboration, my analogy is in the boat. The, the supplier and the customer are in the same boat. Either the boat sinks or it gets to the shore safely. But the, the impact on everybody is the same. Uh, it doesn't matter where the hole is, who, who it's underneath, water fills the boat and it goes to the bottom. So those are just my little uh, mental models that I use to test whether what somebody's telling me is competition or collaboration actually is. Um, there's a couple of uh, slides that I'll, I'll skip over just because this is a, a relatively short presentation. I want to leave some time later on for discussions. Uh, but moving on from procurement, intuitively uh, and behaviorally, a team where members are not inhibited to work together will in general deliver better results. There'll be fewer disagreements. It'll be more creative and innovative and less wasteful and more fun. So forgetting about procurement, purely from a team perspective, where the team members get on and have got aligned objectives that they can all work together and sign up to, that kind of team is more likely to succeed than one where you've got politics, hidden agendas, conflicting objectives. That's something intuitively that, that most of us have either experienced or can, can understand. Now the problem here is when you bring those two things together, because it's, uh, it, it, it's my experience view that the common ways that we contract on significant projects are inherently uncollaborative. So if we're using fixed prices, uh, and fixed price contracts often come with a focus on uh, penalties and or rather damages for breach of contract, they set up a situation where one project team member can win at the expense of another one. I, I feel that the use of fixed prices also adds to the cost and the time that projects take, which may not be in the ultimate project owner's interests. It also incentivizes conservatism. And there's always a risk that you get cost cutting happening that's not visible. I've got no problem with cost cutting on a project if that's a project objective and everybody's signed up to it. But if the cost cutting happens behind the scenes because somebody feels uh, that, that they've got the so-called buyer's curse, you know, they bid far too low and now it's, oh my God, I've won that. How do we make any money out of this? What can we get away with without anybody noticing? So we often increase risk. Uh, and there's many, many tales in the construction field that at least on the surface look like that might be the cause. The other issue you get with fixed prices is that the, the experts in delivery and building things are often engaged very late in the process after key decisions in the design and the planning stage have taken place. Now the other extreme, if we purely decide to uh, reimburse a supplier on the basis of how much effort they've put in, that gives a commercial incentive to maximize the amount of effort and it penalizes suppliers who come up with smart ideas to do the same thing with less effort and spending less money. So the, there are some very strange and conflicting commercial incentives that underpin the sort of project environment where most of the work is bought in. And projects are hard enough anyway, even if everybody does work for the same organization. Uh, when you add this layer of commercial tension over the top, it's, uh, it's almost surprising that, uh, that many projects succeed and hit their original objectives. Uh, 
those of you who are involved in projects that uh, involve a significant amount of contracting will know that it's a field full of terminology and jargon that often means the same thing, but it's given a slightly different name. Um, I think sometimes done deliberately to make it look more complicated as it is. But here are some of the, the, uh, the more common and generic ways of contracting, and in particular, agreeing what will be paid within the contract, and, and how I feel that those align the interests of the different parties, or, uh, or don't. So <coughs> top, less aligned, is that, is that a question, or somebody's cat running around? He's got the mic on. Okay, no question. Um, ranging from fixed prices and reimbursable uh, unit rates that I've just mentioned, that I feel have got relatively low levels of alignment. Each member of the project team commercially looks after their own interests. And, and that makes perfect sense. If that's what the contract says, I'd be obliged to keep the roof over my family ahead of making the overall project successful. And then we go through a range of, of other options of uh, uh, some sort of negotiated prices and setting targets, which sort of include an element of reimbursement, but also have some, some cap in, uh, in, in costs. Uh, and I'm talking about costs, not because it's the only thing of importance to projects, but just because it's uh, uh, an easy thing for us to get our minds around. So we got prices that are negotiated in different ways, guaranteed maximum prices, which still means that there's, if the actual project costs much more than that, there will be pain for somebody. Through to the idea of so-called cost plus contracts, which it makes a very big difference what the plus is. And I don't believe that adding a percentage of the costs that's spent is is particularly aligned way of contracting that would be higher up this list so all the way through to the bottom where fees and gross margins are incentivized and linked to the overall objectives of the project that could be the outputs or the outcomes of the project or in some arrangements linked to the ultimate business benefits resulting from the outputs and outcomes the example that I'm going to share on the uh, short case study is one that is known as CFV or three tier pricing. I'll go into what that means uh, a little bit later on. Uh, this slide is in the pack if any of you are interested. I think I've spoken about uh, most of these issues that I see when you use fixed prices on significant contracts on things like projects where project it's a one-off it's never been done exactly like this before with the same team involved uh, and one of my simple tests for procurement is is to compare how we might select important suppliers with how we select important members of staff and it seems that we spend an awful lot more time and effort in dotting I's, crossing T's, working things out to two decimal places with suppliers than we do with key members of staff. With key members of staff, we accept the fact that there's some uncertainty, we look for certain key characteristics, and we realize that if the selection process takes too long and is too drawn out, the best candidates are not gonna hang around for that long. And I think it's the same with suppliers. So I'll leave that uh, checklist in the slide pack. So the example I want to talk about is a project that used this project alliance or IPD methodology. And if you've not come across this approach to contracting on projects, uh, there's a, a simple analogy comparing on the left the more common approach where a client will contract with a single organization to sort everything out and deliver it, deliver the project. 
and they would tend to do that through a network of subcontractors and suppliers and sub sub suppliers uh, but the contract sorts it all out the client's got this one-stop shop they might have some trusted advisors or they might have some advisors in the early stages that they then pass the responsibility for to the main contractor so that's the comparison case a project alliance has this sort of uh, salmony orangey colored uh, oval which represents the project alliance team and it's not a client and a single supplier but it's a client and a small number of the the most appropriate suppliers who are experts in whatever the field the project is so to compare it to the left hand side that might be the org the type of company who was the main contractor and three or four of the the biggest subcontractors the, uh, the the particular subject matter experts and expertise from design research construction whatever it is your project needs they of course will have a supply network of their own who they may contract with on a relatively uh, arm's length traditional basis they might have some degree of shared risk and reward or variable payment based on how the supply network uh, carries out their own job and as is shown on this sort of reddish colored dotted lines some of those supply smaller suppliers who are selected later on in the process may actually join the project alliance team later on so the project alliance team which is very often contracted in a single contract as opposed to a cascade and chain can have anything between two or three supply members all the way up to 12 15 18 supply members by the time a, a project is complete now the idea is that suppliers who are members of the project alliance sign up and agree to uh, collaborative and collective responsibility for delivering the whole project in a way that their profit margins are intimately linked to the success of the project and how well the project succeeds in the client's eyes and not how well they do their part that's the that's the main difference now I'll, I'll work through an example of what that looks like uh, I won't read out this slide but I'll include it in the PDF that there's a bit of compare and contrast between the more conventional prime or main contracting approach and a multi-party project alliance now you may be thinking why the heck would you go through all that hassle since nobody does it and I can't get the staff to put that in place well there's a couple of bits of uh, research here that have come out in the past few years uh, and they they reflect the experience I had many many years ago uh, before before it was an area of research better results all around the client gets a highly productive faster better cheaper project and results there's less unnecessary stress it's more enjoyable to work in a project of this nature and there's lower risk both of the supply members and to the client now offloading commercial risk down the supply network is not a low risk you haven't offloaded risk you've increased the risk as the project owner as the client that this project is going to cost too much and take too long and potentially will be subject to disputes in the future just because you've got somebody to blame doesn't mean that you've not got that you've got rid of a risk so and if you're interested there's a couple of uh, uh, publicly available documents here that have looked between them well over 100 projects that have been delivered in this neat in this way both private sector and public sector um, tens of billions of dollars worth of construction type of projects where the people involved believe there were some significant benefits to working this way and that reflects my first experience back in the late 1990s on this particular project and I like to go back to this project because it it reminds me of how little we knew at the time when we first ran a project of this nature uh, 
Roman Haas was the client, the chemical company that owned that site on the right, which is uh, up in northeast England, that's the River Tyne. Uh, and UTEC and AMEC were the two uh, supply members of this project alliance. It was not a massive project. It was actually working on the, uh, the production plant smack bang in the middle of this, uh, this photograph. So selection, any of you who've worked in construction uh, will, or, or done any procurement, will recognize the idea of going from a long list to a medium list to a short list. For this project, when we selected the construction partner to join the alliance, to, to kick the alliance off, we had a long list of five, nine companies provided written submissions. We had presentations from five, we shortlisted to two of them and we went to uh, visit some live projects and talk to clients and talk to senior management. And that took us four weeks for, in today's money, about $15 million worth of construction. So not massive, but not tiny either. And the sort of job that if I was doing this in a room and people put their hands up, I would be told would typically take three to six months in many organizations, private and public. But within four weeks, we went through three stages of competitive selection for the collaborative partner. Uh, Fix7, by the way, is just the name given to the project by the client. And nothing more scientific than I think at one time this was called plant number seven and it needed fixing. Uh, but it was a tricky project. Now, I'll just finish off talking about how the um, supply members were paid using this CFV method. And that simply, CFV simply represents the three elements, separate chunks of money that the suppliers are paid. The costs, a fixed fee and a variable fee. So if we take the original total estimate for delivering this project, uh, which is carved up here to show some amount of money that was engineering, the design, procurement and construction management works, the green element is the amount of money expected for construction. And of course, there was some contingency. So that, that represents the total estimate. When the alliance was set up, that was within the same cost envelope. The monies were shuffled around a little bit to reflect costs. And I'll just enlarge that bit, the fixed fee and the variable fee. Uh, and this, this isn't to scale. So cost is third parties to the supply members. So invoices that needed paying for other companies. It meant the direct salary charges of the staff who worked on the project. So no markup, no percentage added to it. The idea of cost is money goes straight through the supply members of the project alliance. The fixed fee and the variable fee is where those companies make their, their gross margin or their contribution from. Uh, as you can see from the color coding, company one and two had different amount of fixed fee and different amounts of potential variable fee. Because there's a clue in the name, the variable fee can vary. So the amounts of money here were if the project hit its targets. So the alignment of the interests is that once the project is underway, the variable fee will be paid dependent upon the overall project performance against the client's key performance indicators. And this client chose five, safety, how long the plant was shut down for and was not producing, uh, when the uh, shutdown happened, that's the idea of schedule, how much it cost, and what the behavior of the team in general looked like from the client's perspective. So, and at the time I worked for one of the suppliers, I, I led the, uh, the contribution from, uh, from UTEC. So once this project started to go through the 
execution stage. So detailed design was being carried out, detailed construction planning, and we moved to construction activity. The only way I could make more money for my company was dependent upon our achievement on these five KPIs. I didn't make any more money from an extra day of a piping designer, and I didn't lose any money for a day less of a piping designer. That was irrelevant. So just to work through what that looked like, each month, the, the total agreed fixed fee was divided by 18 months and a fixed fee was paid. Oh, same every single month. Easy. You don't need any fancy uh, cost engineering to work that out. The costs that were incurred were invoiced every single month. And those would be agreed project staff members at rates that basically reflected their salary, national insurance, uh, pension contributions, healthcare, car, whatever the individuals actually got. Nothing stayed within the company. So the client Roman Haas paid the monthly invoice. The money goes in effect straight out into the banks of the staff who worked on the project, the providers of the company car schemes, or third party invoices that needed paying. So every month, those were the payments that were made. At the end of the project, and because it was an eight, only an 18 month project, both the supply members were happy to wait 18 months for the agreement of the variable fee, because their costs in the meantime had all been covered, they weren't out of pocket, there was good cash flow. And then at the end, the variable fee was based on the actual project performance. And th this project, the agreement of what the variable fee should be at the end, uh, took about an hour. It was one item in a two hour uh, closeout meeting that we had. Again, those of you who have been involved in construction, that's the equivalent of agreeing the final account. And very rarely does it take an hour. So I'll drill down into a bit more detail on how this variable element uh, is worked out and calculated. So the nominal variable fee was divided across the key performance indicators. In this uh, case study, there were five of them. Uh, and each of those has its own defined performance, representing industry average, brilliant, fantastic performance, absolute rubbish. And then each, each of those KPIs has some sort of regime like this that says, if the performance is normal, we'll pay you X. If it's worse than that, we'll pay you less than X, down to zero. And if it's better than that, we'll pay you potentially up to two times X. So for each of those five uh, key performance indicators that I mentioned early on, we had that sort of scheme defined. Now on this case study, the total variable fee, the nominal amount was 300,000. And it was basically two thirds of that related to company one's uh, profit at risk and 100,000, 30%, 33% to company two. Uh, uh, and here's just showing how the 300,000 divides out in those proportions from simple arithmetic. And here's what was actually paid at the end of the day. So you can see by scanning that safety was deemed by being as being fantastic and world-class. The shutdown, ooh, mm, yeah, not very good. That, that loss of the shutdown, by the way, represented two days late in a 28-day shutdown. So it was about 6% over in the estimated time, but that was the agreement. The shutdown happened when it was expected, 45 nominal, 45 paid. As you can see, the project came in significantly under cost. And the client was delighted with the behavior and the approach and the mindset of the whole project team. Uh, so collectively, the suppliers got 60% more than the nominal variable cost. And the client was delighted. Now, just to highlight that this scheme that those additional payments over and above normal were not linked to making savings. 
in this. The cost could have come in slightly over target with no payment, and the other payments would still have been made. This is not a mechanism for sharing savings, just to highlight. So now, of course, a contract itself doesn't deliver anything really. All it did was to remove some obstacles that might have got in the way of collaboration. And, and when putting uh, the presentation together, I was just reminded of a few of the things that we, we actually did as a project team. The team members sat down and said, right, how do we make sure that we make this project a success? From formal and informal approaches to, to team building at the overall senior management level, as well as the detailed, uh, the, the, the more detailed execution level. Uh, our technology focused teams were sort of narrow cross silo teams that looked at a particular functional and technology area where often you would separate uh, one part of design from detailed design from construction to maintenance and operations. We put all the teams together. Uh, if some of you know the method advanced work packaging that sort of touches upon a similar area in a much more formal way than we did. Uh, we had uh, significant efforts put into managing site safety. Uh, we used 3D design tools. This was back in the old days, what would be called BIM these days. Uh, the only difference then is our screens were light green and dark green and uh, color screens were something that uh, were not used certainly in, uh, on our project. And, and the last dot, dot illustrates the sort of, um, it's just an example of hundreds of little micro things that happened. Now, one of the issues on that production site was uh, safety related permits to work for the construction staff. Because it was an operating site, much of the work couldn't be done unless the operation supervisor signed off and, uh, and signed the appropriate bits of paper. A previous project had overspent by about 35%. And most of that was because of delays in getting safety, safety permits issued every morning. So the contractors would come along, say, have you got the safety permits? The operation supervisor would say, no, I've been too busy. OK, we'll come back at 10 o'clock. So they'd go off, they'd drink some tea, read the newspapers, have a chat, come back. And a lot of construction time and effort was wasted uh, because of that sort of lack of uh, coordination between the project, the construction teams and site operations. We had a small amount of contingency because we knew that that might be an issue. But we took that contingency allowance and we spent it by employing uh, a graduate process engineer and got them to come in at four o'clock in the morning every day and work alongside the operations team and run around and do the double checks for them. So although that process engineer couldn't sign off the safety permits, they in effect ensured that the person who could sign it off had all the answers they needed that morning, had everything in front of them. And that proactive activity, spending some contingency, which was in the part of the estimate the construction management company would normally spend, and the process engineer was employed by the uh, EPCM contractor, there was no formality to that. I met with Trevor in a corridor and, and we'd been thinking for a few days how we should reduce the risk of permit delays. We came up with the idea, I made a phone call, and we had somebody on site two days later. So there were, and that was nothing to do with the overarching contract. We decided what to spend the money on, and we got on and did it. So that's just a, a, a simple example. So some of my takeaways from having worked quite a while back and since then supported a number of companies setting these things up. Uh, and th this is why I would take a project alliance as my default go-to approach to contracting on anything but the simplest projects. Uh, 
It's easier and faster to set up and manage than you think, providing you stop doing all the things that you've done historically to prevent commercial problems that you no longer need. So you need to remove those practices and procedures and workflows and sign offs that you would need when you contracted on a fixed price, but you no longer need. So if you just add project alliancing to workflows and practices and templates without changing them, all you'll do is you'll add another layer of complexity. Rip out the things you don't need. And my experience is alliances are a lot easier to contract and a lot easier to manage. If anyone tells me that a project alliance is a premium cost and costs you more, my initial reaction is it must be being done in a very strange and inefficient way. I would expect the cost target on an alliance to be noticeably less than a reliable collection of fixed price bids. And it's much more fun. Projects are hard enough without having to prat about worrying about contracts, in my view. Right, that's the presentation bit that I've put together. Um, looking through the chat, I don't think I can see any questions cropping up. Uh, has anybody got any? Can people manage their own mics uh, on this, Rob? If they want to ask a question or can they type something in? Uh, yeah, good question there, Ian. So people are more than happy to submit their questions via their control panel. Um, some, some of our guests have kindly done this already. So I can I can read those out to you. Mm -hmm. um, first off, there's been a, a number of lovely comments to say thank you for taking the time to, to share your knowledge. Um, and some people have said, is it possible to reach out to you post session to find out more? Um, yeah, of course. Yeah, my, uh, uh, where have I got me? Oh, they're not on there. But yes, you can find me on LinkedIn. There's not many hept installs there, feed out. Uh, <laughs> Excellent. Well, thank you. Ian. Um, so I'll start with the questions as they come in. And Marius from Mace has asked, if a subcontractor knows they have a more embedded position and collaborative relationship, how do you, as the main contractor, ensure you're continuing to receive competitive rates? Um, the, the idea of competitive rates, I'm, I'm less worried about. So. Uh, and, 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 it, and it does depend if if I'm employing somebody as a sub subcontractor conventionally to a member of the project alliance, I do what I do today. Uh, but if I'm if I'm talking about the estimated cost of a project alliance member and, and, and we're thinking, well, you're. You're, you're employing your engineers at, at hiked up rates, you're giving them too much money. Well, firstly, what's the motivation for doing that? Because in a conventional rate, it's not just the, the money that gets paid to the, the tradesman, the person doing the work. Uh, it's also the margin and the markup of the organization that's built in to most rates. In the CFV method, those are totally separate. So there is no commercial motivation for the supply member to, to spend more on rates. The only way that they would increase the cost rates is if more money ended up in the pocket of the individual doing the work. Now, sometimes there's a good reason for employing somebody who's more expensive, and sometimes it's wasteful. What, what I find on a project alliance is that in a conventional main sub subbies network, if if one of the subcontractors or sub subcontractors is is you know, playing a game and getting away with something, well, normally some people around them know it's happening, but they won't grasp them up to the main contractor or the client. the 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 rule of the game is it's for the main contractor to catch them out. So in effect, you've got you've got one pair of eyes looking for somebody who's either being too lazy, is employing far too many people just to keep them busy. With a project alliance, 
that sort of behavior is not only going to hit the main contractor or the client, it's going to hit the other alliance members. So from a, a risk that people are playing games and messing about, you've got many more different organizations keeping an eye on that because in, in the rates, conventional rates, as I said, have got margin built into them. They're a mechanism for companies to recover margin. The CFV method doesn't have that sort of conventional rate. All you're paying in cost terms is what ends up in the bank of the individual or to the pension provider. So it's slightly different. Then the discussion is, do we want person who demands a higher salary or a lower salary? And ultimately the project team can make a, a, a quality based decision because there's no right answer to that. You don't get better projects just by having cheaper people. Yeah. Excellent. Thank you, Ian. And, and Marius, I, I hope that answers your question. Hopefully, not, let me know. You engage with Ian. Um, yeah. So there's, again, some great comments coming through. Uh, Daniel has started by saying, very enjoyable presentation. Thank you. How do you avoid the client taking advantage of the IPD by possibly suggesting or manipulating the outcomes, suggesting they aren't successful as they are, and thus true profits potentially not being achieved by the supply chain? Uh, that, that's a good question, because in, in the whole a area of performance related payment, that's probably the most common and the biggest risk that crops up. You know, people sign up to something and then renege on the deal later on. Uh, firstly, being reasonably clear about how performance will be measured. Not over precise, because you can tie yourself up in knots if you're not careful. So on that fix seven case, the, uh, the five key performance indicators and the way that they would be measured were written and embedded in the contract that was formalized and signed and agreed. So it was quite clear what was included in cost and what wasn't included. And it was quite clear if costs came to this much, here's the formula for working out what payment is due. And that's a contractual payment. It's not, it's not like a, a, an employee's bonus, which is optional and uh, the directors can choose to pull the plug on the bonus scheme if they think it's paying too much. It's a contractual obligation. Which, which clients could be held to if some for, for, for serious breach of contract if they refuse to pay it. So you, you can still be reasonably precise on those payment mechanisms. It's quite clear if the plant was producing on day one or day 10. And so once we had clear measures, we kept them relatively simple. I suppose the iffy one was 10% against behaviors. And we did define the range of staff that would be surveyed and the, the degree of independence in that. Uh, but ultimately, if I don't think the organization is trustworthy enough and really means it, I wouldn't enter into this sort of contract. Uh, and that works both ways, the due diligence. So one of the key, the, the most important selection criteria when we engage the construction partner was do we trust them? And that was done talking to the person who would be their contract manager and the directors back at head office. We needed to feel that there was enough faith and confidence and trust. Excellent, thank you Ian. Now I'm, I'm aware of the time and uh, I'm also aware that I'm in a room full of project management professionals and, and time and keeping to deadlines is important, but I'm, I'm also- Business I'm management. Also, more important than our time estimate if there's, yes. benefit, if there's I, benefit to people yes so. I'm, I'm also a cheeky host so i'm gonna i'm gonna try and get one more question in um yep. michael has asked what does a typical cfb agreement look like maybe you could refer us to your preferred format or somewhere to get additional information okay yeah i can uh, i can let people know that there's a couple of model forms that exist around the world and the the nec4 has recently produced one that i don't know that intimately uh, i personally prefer a bespoke agreement that builds from sort of flip charts around the wall amongst the leadership team 
and then the so-called boilerplate gets added on later because that builds on the important relationships and the testing of trust and add the other stuff on. Uh, starting with some boilerplate with gaps in that you write in the, the, the missing words uh, can make it become back office. But around the world, there are some quite reasonable uh, model forms that could be used. But I'd still start with the flip chart to work out the obligations but then giving it to the contract drafters. I don't really care whether they take a model form and squeeze the flip charts into the model form. But, but what surprised me the first time I did it was how easy and fast it was the well-briefed legal team to write a bespoke contract that we signed. It, I have tried to do an alliance by modifying the iChemE Green Book once, and that took much longer. That was a real pain. And the problem is, it's so tortuous to read that if, if a key member of one of the Alliance partners joined the project a bit later on, they're not going to sit and read it. But if, if you can have something that's in a readable form and somebody can get their mind around their obligations, I think that's better from risk than something like, uh, and I hope I'm not, got too, not, not offending too many NEC fans out there, but yeah, I know contracts and I know procurement. But I can't get my mind around NEC where the first page says, the project program is the project program. Just one of them's got capital letters. That, what, what, what director of a key subcontractor is gonna wade through two pages of, yeah, the project manager is the project manager. Well, I can assure you, Ian, that no one from the NEC world has uh, commented to, to attack uh, you on your comments yeah. there. So that's, that's really good. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to welcome back Martin, um, okay. co-chair of the APM SWE branch at this point. But as um, the APM branches manager, I would personally like to say thank you to, to Ian for giving up your time and your expertise this evening for tonight's webinar. Um, I'd also encourage everyone to go and look at the APM web, website and have a look at the future contracts and procurement SIG events coming up. Uh, so Ian, thank you. Okay. And, uh, and, and thank you for me, Ian, very much indeed. A really interesting sort of uh, gallop through. It's part of my background is with defence and uh, working on sort of contracts and procurements for many years. I've worked on things similar to this, but under an alliance type approach to risk management, but uh, using conventional con contracts, which can work very well as well with risk sharing. But uh, I think what you're doing is far, far, far in advance what I've been doing in the past. <laughs> but, uh, really enlightening. And thank you very much for sharing your experience. That's really valuable, actually, that uh, sharing what you've done and making mm -hmm. it real for people. And uh, some real lessons can come out of that and some real sort of uh, professional development can go on uh, with, our, with, with, our, with our members who have joined yeah. us this evening. So yeah. thank you once all once again. And thank you, uh, Rob, for sort of managing us extremely well as usual. <laughs> Uh, we're no, on the expertise no. of making sure the technology works and uh, have, a, have a good evening everyone and please remember to let us have your feedback on the evaluation survey when it comes out to you uh, when, in the next two or three days. Thank you very much indeed. Okay, well, thanks. Okay, thank, thank you everyone. Good night everyone. Bye. Bye. Bye.